All right. So to the recorded audience, welcome. I have a couple of students in the Zoom room with me now. Um, and just to remind everyone, this session, this MTEL Saturday session is going to be focused on the English language subject test. Um, I'm going to go over the different MTEL exams that teacher candidates in Massachusetts are required to take. But today's session is going to be specific to the English language subject test, um, the English uh, language and literature rather. Um, but just so you know, a lot of these tricks and tips also apply to the communication and literacy exam. So I'm going to talk about all of that and my next Saturday session will be focused specifically on communication and literacy, right? Um, okay, so with no further ado, let's get to this absolutely beautiful PowerPoint presentation that I have prepared for you. Very special, I know. And I wonder, um, well, I hope that it's going to be recording the the screen share too. We, we shall see, I guess. Um, and if not, um, I'll just record this separately. So I think we're just gonna be just fine. Um, okay. So yes, this is our MTEL Saturday session. Um, yes, it's totally fine. Um, for those of y'all who are, who are in the Zoom room live right now, it is totally fine if you have cameras off, mute yourself, whatever you're comfortable with. And that goes for all of the MTEL Saturday sessions, right? Since I can't bring you donuts and, and, uh, and coffee in the beautiful halls of Bates. Um, okay, so I think um, you, both of y'all know me, but uh, my name is Professor Hermanson. I'm an assistant professor in the English department. Um, this is my fifth year at Westfield State and I teach uh, mostly writing courses at Westfield State, but I also teach a rhetoric class in the form of English 303 Persuasive Communication. Um, and I teach English 206 Principles and Applications of Grammar, which is required of all of our teacher education track students. And in the past, I've also taught English 383, which is Issues in the Teaching of Writing, which is also required for English uh, education majors. And um, I've also taught a graduate level rhetoric course. Um, so that's my background. I'm also a member of the English Education Committee alongside Professor Serginides and Professor de Grazia. And my email address is on the screen, um, just in case any of y'all need that. Um, okay, so let us talk about this. Let me see here. Okay, perfect. So as I have mentioned before, there are two different kind of stages of the MTEL. The first is the communication and literacy test. And this is a computer-based test that is required of every person who is seeking teacher licensure in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Regardless of their area of concentration, regardless of what they hope to teach, everyone has to take the communication and literacy test. And basically what this test is testing is your knowledge of effective written communication and reading skills, right? So this is a test that is administered online, um, especially now in the era of COVID. I, I believe that this is offered as like a still as a kind of distance test. So you can take this at home. I don't know though, how that's going to change. So anyone watching this recording, you know, this is, I'm recording this in, in mid-November of 2020. Any of this is subject to change. So be sure to check on that. But the structure of the exam won't change. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a reading subtest that contains 42 multiple choice questions. This basically tests your reading comprehension skills, which might be scary to some of you who have, you know, anxiety around taking standardized tests because standardized tests, as we're going to talk about in a moment, are already miserable. And if you throw in the component of demonstrating your reading comprehension, a lot of you might struggle with reading comprehension in general, especially in a high stakes environment. But I'm going to help you guys in our next MTEL session with how to deal with reading passages quickly and answering questions about them correctly, right? So 42 multiple choice reading questions, and then there's a writing subtest. So this is testing your understanding of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, mostly of English syntax, of grammar, punctuation, conventions of academic written standard English, right? Um, as Which is, I know, a problematic concept in and of itself, but anyway. Um, so there's 35 multiple choice questions, seven short answer sentence correction items, and two open response assignments. So this is where you're expected to respond to a prompt, right? 
So this test I find to be the easiest to prepare for because there's a limited kind of range of questions that it asks you. And again, my next Saturday session, the date of that is TBA, but it'll be soon. Um, I'm gonna go over just specifically the common literacy exam. Okay, but I find this one to be relatively easy to prepare for. <clears throat> what we're talking about today is the English subject test, which is a computer-based test. Once again, it's an online proctored test that has 100 multiple choice questions and two open response questions. This is what gets tricky. The English test is being redeveloped and is going to be retired in early 2021. So again, right now it is the middle of November of 2020. So we are looking at the last gasps of the old Intel, which is called the 07 test. So it's being redeveloped. The new test is available in early 2021. But if you register for the Intel now, you are going to be taking the older version of the test, right? So as long as you register before they bring this new test into play, you will take the older test, right? Um, and this link, this is this this link will take you those of y'all because you will have this presentation available in the folder I sent you. This link will take you to uh, official information from the MTEL about that new test, right? But I'll, I'm going to talk to you about what you need to know about it. Okay. So starting with some honest conversation about this, there's some stuff that we just can't get around. Um, the kind of biggest undeniable reality of our lives is that standardized tests are hugely unpleasant for almost everyone who takes them, right? Uh, I've met a handful of people over years of helping people prepare for standardized tests, a handful of people who love them. They like the predictability, they like the structure, they feel like they can outsmart it. It's a comfortable medium for them. The vast majority of people though do not enjoy taking standardized tests, so you're not alone. They suck, they cannot and do not measure any of these things. They do not measure how good a student you are. They do not measure how good a teacher you're going to be. They don't measure how prepared you are to teach. They don't measure how smart you are, how worthy of love you are. They do not measure any of those things, right? What they are supposed to measure is your familiarity with the subject matter that you'll be expected to teach in English language arts classrooms at the middle and high school levels and your knowledge of basic principles of teaching methods, right? That's the intention. That's the material that, that you're expected to cover. But if we narrow this down to what I believe is the truth, what they actually measure is how good you are at taking standardized tests. And that's it. And this goes for any standardized test, right? And so if we think about it, what makes standardized tests so unpleasant, I think especially for English majors is among other things that we are expected, I think in most English classes to have room to defend our positions or to defend our answers, right? Most of the assignments in English literature classes are essays and papers in which we don't just make assertions, we can demonstrate our points, we can demonstrate our ideas, we pull in examples from the text, we um, you know, illustrate it with our own interpretation. And of course, in this situation, we have to choose from a limited range of options and we're not allowed to you know, d uh, elaborate on any element of it, right? And other problems that students talk about having, you know, this is just a, a, a very kind of informal survey of what I've heard students are concerned about. The biggest concern that students have is that they don't feel like they have enough time, right? So feeling rushed, feeling as if they don't have time to go back and check their work, feeling as if they don't have time to completely um, like give each question the consideration that it deserves. So feeling rushed, feeling as if you're, you're pressed for time. That's part of what makes it so challenging, right? If you had an infinite amount of time to do this, um, it would be a lot easier. And the Intel is not interested in making life any easier for you, right? Um, another common problem is that some students will be tempted to skip questions or skip sections. Um, and I'm going to talk about how that is not necessarily a good idea um, as we continue. And another common problem is that some of the questions might be unclear or confusing, right? Um, so these are just some of the, again, some of the more common 
issues that students report when taking the MTEL, right? And um, those of y'all who are in the um, in the room, if y'all have any other issues with standardized tests that you've experienced, if you'll type those in the chat, I'd love to know um, what else has given you problems when it comes to standardized tests. Um, okay. <clears throat> so you might have heard about different kind of tips and tricks that you can use to make the MTEL easier. Maybe there are some tips and tricks that you heard back when you were preparing to take the SAT or tips and tricks that you heard when you're taking the MCAS or something along those lines. Um, but you will always hear people talk about kind of shortcuts for doing well on standardized tests, right? There are some test prep sites that I have seen that will say, for example, if you are doing a reading comprehension section, that you should never read the passage, that you should instead read the question and then go back to the passage and look for the answer. I cannot stress this enough. It's an awful idea. Um, I've also had, <clears throat> I've, I've heard um, some people say you should skip questions, right? You should go to the questions that you know and then go back to the ones that you're not sure about in the interest of saving time. Another approach that I think is not as good as just preparing to answer questions correctly. That's your best strategy when it comes to the MTEL. So tips and tricks just aren't the way to get a better score on the MTEL. So every test is different. So the best approach is to be familiar enough with the test and your own timing strategy to get the maximum number of points, to get the mass, maximum number of answers correct, right? That's our goal. So the good news in pursuit of that goal is that the MTEL is a really predictable test. So once you learn the patterns, you'll be more comfortable with how they ask you questions. And they ask questions about the same material over and over again. So they will never completely shock you or surprise you with like brand new information, right? Okay, so this, uh, it pertains to the old test. So there are two types of questions on the old test, open, response and multiple choice. And they test about four different, what they call sub areas, right? So I'm gonna to talk to y'all about these. I'm going to focus in this whole session about the old test. And I have a good reason for that. We don't know what the new test will look like yet. So I haven't seen it. I don't know what the changes are going to be. I know very generally what changes are going to be made, but I haven't actually seen or taken the new test. So this is all brand new to me too. Once I've seen it, I can absolutely help y'all prepare for it. But until I've seen it, there's not much I can say, right? But we can assume that it will retain some of the same question types, if not most of them, right? Um, okay, so these are the types of questions. Uh, language and literature, um, they will ask about, and I'm gonna go into each of these in more detail, um, it's about 51% of the test, so most of it. Rhetoric and composition, which the approximate test weighting is 17% of questions. Reading theory, research and instruction is about 12%. So multiple choice questions are 80% of the test. Then there are 20% open response, okay? And open response items may relate to any of the first three sub areas, right? Um, okay, so... <laughs> And that's a link, by the way, to a, a content study guide for the old test. So this is what they have told us the new test is going to look like, that there will be two types of questions, again, multiple choice and open response. Um, but as you can see, they have gotten rid of the reading theory, research and instruction sub area. So instead, there is equal weight given to reading and language, as they've called it. So the assumption is that they've pulled some of those questions about reading theory, practice and instruction into this umbrella category of reading and language. That's the assumption, right? And it has equal weight with the rhetoric and composition sub area. So again, multiple choice questions, once again, are 80% of this test. And then there's a newly defined sub area of open response questions called integration of knowledge and understanding. And they're telling us this time what these two um, open response questions are going to be. So one of them is analysis of a literary or informational text, and the other is development of an argument in response to a written test. So once again, they're trying to evenly balance the rhetoric and composition area of the test 
and the knowledge of reading theory and practice and language and literature. So that's the new test again. I'm not going to be talking about it today because I don't I don't know what to expect as far as those changes are concerned. But it looks like they're putting more weight on writing on understanding principles related to how to teach students to write effective, well organized, mostly persuasive texts. That's my understanding. And you know, rhetoric and composition is is hugely focused on persuasive text, on how to make text more effective with particular audiences. So we can assume also based on the fact that one of the open response questions is guaranteed to be development of an argument in response to a written test, that there's going to be more emphasis on argumentation. I think that's fantastic because that's my whole area of study. I love argument. I love rhetoric and composition. Um, but it does make the test um, a little bit, I think, a little bit more unpredictable. Right now, I can tell you, as far as the, you know, the last dying breaths of the 07, the old tests are concerned, I can tell you it is overwhelmingly questions about literary movements, genres, themes, and time periods, okay? Now I don't really know what that balance is going to be like. I know what they're telling me, but you know, when I have the test, I'll, I'll, I'll have another session, many other sessions and help you all prepare for that. Okay, so this is these, these slides pertain to the old test, these, right? So I'm going to walk you all through these categories one by one. So this first category is language and literature. So these are questions about major literary movements, genres, themes, and time periods. They also will ask about major historical trends, issues, and ideas. This is, I think, the most challenging area of the MTEL English subject test to prepare for because there's not really a good cheat sheet for it other than just <clears throat> being familiar with major literary movements, genres, themes, and time periods. There's not really a great shortcut other than you need to have good content knowledge. You need to have good content area knowledge of these subjects. How might you do that? The number one way is to start paying attention to discussions about this kind of stuff in your literature classes, right? And y'all, if y'all are looking at this early, that's great because you can be attentive to you know, if you're in a class and you start talking about the qualities of Victorian literature, or if you're taking an American literature test and you all start talking about Southern Gothic and features of Southern Gothic literature, you can kind of put that in your noggin in a little folder titled, this might come up on the Intel. And that's the best way to prepare is to look for this kind of information that might come up in your literature classes, right? Another good way to prepare I'm going to show you all what some of the things that I've put in this Google Drive folder. Um, another good way to prepare is just to brush up on those literary time periods, right? So in this Google folder, to make that a little bit easier for you, I've added several files. So this is just an overview of early periods of literature, right? So I have given you here um, basic introductions to, you know, medieval literature, to the Renaissance and Reformation, to the Enlightenment, to ro the Romantic period, the Victorian period, postmodernism, and you see that it tells you some basic features of that genre or of that period and some of the bigger writers in that period, right? And you will see in just a moment why that comes in so handy. So this is just a kind of a basic timeline to familiarize yourself with. And I've given you several options here. So my advice is to choose whichever one of these kind of works best with your learning style and with your brain, right? Um, here are some other examples. Um, this is a little handout about different movements in literature, um, different time periods, um, movements that people that are associated with these different movements. So for example, if I look at romanticism, right, you can see that the definition here is an artistic and intellectual movement in the history of ideas that originated in late 18th century Western Europe. It stressed strong emotion, the individual imagination as a critical authority, and overturning previous social conventions, particularly the position of the aristocracy. There's a strong element of historical and natural inevitability in its ideas stressing the importance of nature in art and language and the experience of sublimity 
through a connection with nature. So uh, the, these are exactly the kinds of questions that you will be asked about periods and genres on the MTEL. I'll show you in a moment. And you see also that it has a list of, you know, some of like the big key major players in each of these areas. So obviously romanticism, Wordsworth, Byron, Shelley, Blake, Keats, Tennyson, all of the, all the, all the, uh, the, the big names there. And it goes on through those other time periods to tell you the same thing. Um, I've also included another flyer that tells you to sort of a more basic kind of timeline of these different periods. Um, of, of different literary periods, of different, you know, people and different texts that you might ex expect to see in those periods. That's a practice test. Um, here's another, in case, you know, British literature is particularly confusing to you, I've included a timeline of British literature, literary time periods. Um, and this is another, just in case you want a literary timeline that is graphically organized a little bit differently. Um, so I've given you a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of different options. You don't have to obviously study or review all of these, but pick one that you like looking at or that helps you learn and committing this stuff to memory or being comfortable talking about it um, will really come in handy. Or even one thing I might suggest is, let's say you're reading about the Victorian period and you read here about you know Oscar Wilde and you've never read anything by Oscar Wilde. It doesn't mean you have to go out and get portrait of artist as a young man or whatever and read that cover to cover. Um, but maybe like poke around and look at the at his Wikipedia page or look at a, a short story or a poem or watch a YouTube video about Oscar Wilde or just kind of like dip your toes in in a way to get you familiar with that person and with that work if you haven't encountered them in your classes. But the best way to prepare for this is early in your career as an English major to start synthesizing and thinking critically about what you're reading in your classes, about what you're encountering in your classes, and kind of understanding those as working together, um, and and you know like comparing different time periods, comparing different movements, different authors, etc. But I'm about to show you all why this kind of uh, of handout is so helpful for preparing for this part of the test. Let me show you. Here are some examples of language and literature questions, right? So I know the font might be a little bit small here, but bear with me. So this question asks, and I'm not going to read this whole passage, but this question asks, read the excerpt below from The Grapes of Wrath, a 1939 novel by John Steinbeck, then answer the question that follows. So we have the passage, and then this is the question stem, right? This is the actual question that you're being asked to answer. This excerpt most clearly addresses which of the following themes of early 20th century American literature. So you see, there aren't a whole lot of shortcuts around this idea of like, you kind of just need to be familiar with what themes came up in early 20th century American literature. But I am gonna tell you all some tips and tricks for like, if you just absolutely don't know, I'm gonna give you some tricks for eliminating wrong answers, which is going to be your best friend as far as strategies go. Um, when you take this test, right? Um, and in fact, we can, after we talk about wrong answer types, uh, we can come back to this question and, and, and identify the correct answer. But for now, I just want you to see kind of an overview of the type of questions you might see in the literature and language section. Okay, here's another example. Read the excerpt below, then answer the question that follows. Here's the passage. The question stem says, the style and subject matter of this excerpt are most characteristic of which of the following novelistic genres of the Victorian period. So once again, as I discussed with y'all before, you can see why the type of handout that I showed y'all, this one is so useful in preparing for this kind of exam, right? Just because, in, just in case it's something that you haven't studied in your classes, just in case it's something that you're not, you know, off, right off the bat familiar with, you have another source of information you can rely on, okay? So we will come back actually to these questions because I can, again, these will be really good practice for when we start looking at uh, wrong answer types. But so those are the language and literature tests that you, or questions you can expect to see, questions about major literary movements, genres, themes, and time periods, okay. Hmm. Do y'all have any questions, my synchronous friends? All 
Okay, good. If, any, if, if you do, please just type them in the chat. Good. Thank you for the thumbs up. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> do you feel a little bit less terrified of this test so far? I hope you can do it. We can do it together. Okay. So the second subcategory of question on the English language test is rhetoric and composition. Again, this is my personal favorite. It's my jam. I love it. You might not be as excited about it. These questions ask you about writing strategy. So lots of questions about purpose, main point, theme, tone, audience, these kinds of things, big, you know, rhetorical considerations, organization. So where certain sentences or words go, they will really often ask you, you know, if you looked at this paragraph, look at the first sentence, is there another paragraph where that sentence would be better suited? So basically it wants to know that you understand how to group similar or related ideas in paragraphs. It wants to know that you are savvy enough to teach writing to English language students, right? That's basically what they're asking you. There are also questions about style, about clarity and consistency. And my little note here is to think about your comp class, right? Think about when you took comp one and comp two, these kind of rhetorical considerations, these are the kind of questions that you're going to be asked about, right? Um, okay, and they will also, let's see, I'm actually going to skip this for now because this falls in the category of stuff that we don't really know is going to change as we go along. But anyway, I'll show you a couple of sample questions here. These are both rhetoric and composition questions. Which of the following strategies would most effectively help a writer to identify problems with the rhythm and flow of a composition? <clears throat> so that question about rhythm and flow, helping a writer to achieve something rhetorically through a written work, those are rhetoric and composition questions, right? And you see that the options are reading the composition aloud, examining each sentence of the composition for meaning, reviewing the parts of speech of each sentence in the composition, replacing long words in the composition with shorter words. God, I can't wait to talk to y'all about wrong answer elimination because this one is just like ripe for the picking because these are pre preposterous answer options. Um, but we'll come back to that when we look at the, when we look at, at answer option elimination. Okay. And then next, here's another rhetoric and composition question. Use the outline below to answer the question that follows. A student is developing a four paragraph essay about his hobby of spinning wool into yarn. That's quaint. A draft of the student's outline for the essay appears below. There's the outline. There's a blank space there um, in section three, sub point B. Given this outline, the question asks, which of the following supporting points would be the most appropriate for the student to include in the third paragraph? And then it gives some options. So as you can see, this is kind of narrowing in on um, organization on how to create a, you know, cohesive and well-organized text, how to plan out where certain points should go in order to make, make an argument most effectively. So that's what's going on there. Right. And we'll come back to those questions. Um, and then the next area, this is also something that is going to come up heavily on the communication and literacy subtest. So this is a great time to start practicing this. Also, I know that Emily, you are enrolled in my English 206 class, which will definitely come in handy. Um, this is the usage and mechanics section of questions. So these ask about punctuation, grammar and usage and sentence structure, right? Um, so here's two examples of these usage and mechanics questions. Which of the following sentences contains an error in punctuation? Then you have four options. Uh, which of the following sentences contains a comma splice? And then you have four answer options, right? So you need to obviously be familiar enough with correct punctuation and what a comma splice is in order to answer those. Yeah, and we'll, we're gonna come back to these, don't worry. But just, this is an overview of question types, right? So the third sub area is reading, research, theory, and instruction. So these are questions about teaching methods and theory, particularly about reading. And there are also questions about teaching English language learners or what you will sometimes see referred to as ESL students or English as a second language students, right? Even though that nomenclature is kind of falling out of favor. So I will admit this is not my area of expertise. In fact, when I look at sample MTELs, when I take sample MTELs, I am 
given the most pause by these questions because I don't have a background in the effective teaching of reading, right, at the middle and high school levels. So in a lot of situations, this is where y'all might need to draw from classes that you have taken in the education department. Um, you will also learn about these, this kind of subject matter from uh, young adult literature with Professor Sarah Janides. Um, this is also something that might be covered in middle school and its students, if y'all take, have taken that class. Um, so these are questions, again, that are a little bit outside of my subject area. But the good news is I can help you by helping you eliminate wrong answers when it comes to these kinds of questions. But so these are two examples of questions in that area. Uh, which of the following statements best describes the purpose of using the results of an informal reading inventory to plan reading instruction? A lot of these kind of questions too, I think are just, if you sit with them for a minute, they become kind of intuitive. So that's something I think that's beneficial. Um, here's another question. Which of the following instructional strategies would be most likely to promote independent reading by students in a middle school English class? So um, just a few questions about how to, uh, how, how to incorporate, you know, and, and you'll see that most of these are reading related. And again, that's because if we look at our area, reading research, theory, and instruction. And for those of y'all who aren't going to take this test until the new test is introduced, um, this is where these kind of questions are going to be included is in this reading and language section. So my suspicion is that there might be a little bit, you know, there'll be more questions that they'll pull from this area than they did before, since before reading theory only accounted for 12% of the test. And now it looks like reading and language together are going to constitute 40% of the test. So there might be some more questions in this area. Um, but I think that y'all's education classes will really come in handy when it comes to being able to answer these correctly. And also your um, exposure to the strategies I'm going to teach you about eliminating wrong answer options, right, which we're going to get to in just a moment. Um, okay, so we're going to take just a quick uh, break. Um, I'm going to give you all just like a five minute breather since we're done with the kind of first part of doing an overview of what we expect to see on the English language uh, uh, subject test. And when we come back, we are going to talk about how to best prepare for the types of questions asked on the test. I'm going to talk to you all about how to eliminate and identify wrong answer options. And then we are going to do some practice and go back and review the sample questions that came up while we were doing this cursory look at question types. Okay. Um, so yes, we will come back together at, uh, let's just make it an even, 1150 so that makes that a slightly longer break um, but we'll come back together um, and finish our discussion okay perfect and we are back um are y'all ready to go spencer and emily Perfect. All right, excellent. I see two big enthusiastic thumbs up. Yay. Okay. It's amazing how much just a little break and a little stretching and a little breathing can do for one's ability to learn about this crap. Um, okay. So now that we've gone over those question types, as we can expect them to appear, at least on the old test, and I can't imagine that the actual structure of the questions is gonna change much when we see the new test, new test, but who knows? So you might be wondering, do you need to memorize these question types? Absolutely, 100%, no, you do not. But you do need to be familiar with the patterns because they ask you the same types of questions over and over and over again. So I mentioned to you that the MTEL is a predictable test. It is a very predictable test. It will not blindside you. They only ask you from like a, they draw from a limited range of information. But I do want to mention to you one area of this type of question, of language and literature question that you are likely to find more challenging than others based on what I've heard from students. They ask 
about global literature. So you might see questions about, you know, African literature, Indian literature, like not a whole bunch, but you will see some questions that will ask you about some, you know, world literature movements and periods that you might not be familiar with. That is something that I found that students say they find challenging. But one of the files that I posted in the Google Drive folder will help you to familiarize yourself with that, you know, with those kinds of areas, but just something to be aware of, right? Okay. So anyway, the MTEL will not blindside you. So the best way to prepare is to become familiar with the types of questions asked on the test and to remember that the test contains patterns and you are going to be asked about the same material in different ways, but the way that those questions are asked will follow specific patterns, right? And in my opinion, unless you just have studied and prepared and you immediately know the right answer to something, one way that you can approach a question in order to get it correct is to just kind of use your best judgment and intuit the answer from what you are seeing. So for example, if there's a passage about, you know, Gothic literature and you're not familiar with that, you can take, I think, a lot of those assumptions that you might make when you hear Gothic, right? Dark, kind of melodramatic, dealing with, you know, themes of life and death and very existential kind of feeling to it. You can take a lot of what you know about Gothic literature, about like you know, kind of the idea of the Gothic in general, and apply some of those assumptions to guessing, right? And we'll see that that can kind of come in handy. Another good technique, if you encounter a question and you just don't know at all what to expect from it, is to eliminate wrong answers, right? And one of the ways that you can do this is to look for answers that are too specific. And the reason that I'm so enthusiastic about eliminating wrong answers is, and I'm not a mathematician, so please, if I screw this up, either forgive me or correct me. If I have four answer options and I just guess, I have about a 25% chance of getting that question right, right? If I eliminate one of those answer options, I have gone from having a 25% chance to having a 33.3333333% chance of getting it right, right? Is that about right? If I can eliminate two wrong answer options, then I've given myself a 50-50 shot. So I think in terms of questions where you're like, I just straight up don't know this, eliminating wrong answers is a really good technique, right? So the first type of wrong answer option that you're going to see on the MTEL, because you can spot these without knowing the subject matter, is that there are answers that are too specific for the nature of the question, right? So they will offer some really niche, really specific bit of information. And wrong answer options on standardized tests are always trying to bait you, right? They look like right answer options if you're not paying attention, but if you're paying attention and you're used to looking for them, then they seem really obvious, right? So these are answer options that are too specific to be the answer. So here's an example, and I've highlighted the right answer here, but be because I hope that seeing it right in front of you will be better than you trying to guess which one is more specific, is too specific. So the question is, in which of the following ways did Samuel Beckett's play Waiting for Godot most significantly influenced the development of drama in Great Britain during the 20th century. Let's say you get this question and you've never read Beckett. You don't know anything about Waiting for Godot. You don't know anything about 20th century drama in Great Britain. You're like, I'm screwed. What do I do here? Well, look at some of these answer options. Look at answer option A. The stylized masks used by performers in the play were based on those from Japanese no drama. That should immediately raise some red flags to you in terms of being way too specific. It's, it's too specific. The MTEL is looking for general ideas and general trends about major periods and genres in literature. It would not ask you something as specific as types of masks that were based on Japanese masks, right? It's way too specific. Um, and I'm going to show you again, in fact, another wrong answer option in this very, you know, for this very question. Uh, but the answer to this is absolutely not A. That, that is way too specific. 
It is not something that would be asked about. Remember, the MTEL wants to know big ideas, big themes, big trends, abstract concepts, right? You notice that it's looking for how that play most influenced the development of drama. So that would be like asking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of an, of an equivalent here. It would be like asking, um, you know, in what ways did, you know, the, the 2020 presidential election influence, you know, electoral politics in the United States? And you say something like, well, the color of the neckties that the candidates wore was, was important and significant. It's too specific, right? It's not going to ask you anything that's in the nitty gritty quite that much, right? So that is a wrong answer option. We can eliminate it. That's great. Now, if I have no clue what I'm doing, I've given myself a much better chance of getting this right, right? Another wrong answer option, I have. I had a student who used to call these dementors. I don't know if that's how you want to think of it, whatever. Um, but this is a wrong answer option that I always just call it, it's out there. It's either too brainy, as I call it. And I know that might sound kind of silly because we're talking about a really sophisticated test. But by too brainy, I mean, it is preying on the fact that you don't know so they think that you're going to gravitate towards something that sounds so complicated that it must be the right answer. It's like it's it goes too far in the other direction and it becomes it's too erudite, it's too out there. It pulls in information that's not relevant to the question. Um, and again, it's a distraction because if you just have no clue what you're looking for, then something that's more complicated or has bigger words that you don't understand is going to look correct, right? So here's an example of that. That question that I just asked you or ju we just looked at about waiting for Godot. Look at answer option D. The play's unrealistic set reflected the French symbolist philosophy that valued aesthetics over reality. Maybe you are really in deep with you know French symbolist philosophy and you are you know interested in talking about like surrealism and the development of drama in Great Britain but think about it remember that this is prepare this is testing your preparation to teach middle and high school English language arts this is a very brainy answer that is outside the scope of this question so you know even though it's not it's also like not really true you don't have to know that in order to know that it's a type of distractor. It's a type of wrong answer option because it has those hallmarks of being a little bit too brainy. The MTEL's ideal hotspot of an answer is one that looks at big, major, significant themes, but doesn't go too far in the weeds, right? So we can eliminate A and D. And if you don't know how to do this right now, you will because we're going to practice it. Um, and as you look at sample text, you'll see how this happens. But A and D are wrong. So we have now given ourselves a 50-50 shot of answering this question correctly, which is absolutely fantastic. So let's look at these two options and see if we can pick one of them that is either too specific, that we know is wrong, or has that too brainy, too far out there type of quality to it, right? B says the vernacular language used by the characters in the play reflected the dramatic qualities of everyday speech, or C, the play's unstructured plot and existential theme introduced absurdism to a general audience. Okay. Um, what do you all think, those of you who are here synchronously, and those of you who are here asynchronously, just kind of chew on these two answer options. Is there one of those that feels kind of more like that perfect sweet spot of an MTEL answer than the other, one that looks at major trends, major themes, um, you know, that looks at the, the influence of the development of drama, the way the question STEM asks, and is there one that looks maybe a little bit too specific or a little bit too in the weeds for this question? Emily, you are absolutely correct. M C seems right. You are absolutely spot on because C is right. That is absolutely right. The play's unstructured plot and existential theme. Do you see how it's looking at? I love that Spencer did the little celebration and react. 
Yeah. Do you see how even the fact that it has that it that it has that word theme and that it looks at absurdism, even if you don't know what that is, it's not quite as far in the weeds as D. It, I like that you said it seems right. And sometimes if we just don't know what we're doing, that might be our best bet. B, I think, is too specific, right? This idea of like the vernacular language, you know, sometimes they'll ask about like which of these answer options is the most right, right? And in that case, it gets a little bit tougher, but the language is a little bit too specific. The masks are, that's way too specific. The unrealistic set reflected the French symbolist philosophy, idea, valued aesthetics. Blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. C is in that sweet spot and C is correct. Now, if you know Waiting for Godot, if you read that in one of your classes at WSU and you're like, oh shit, pr excuse my language. Um, Professor Starr talked to us about Waiting for Godot. I, I totally know this. Then, hey, you can bypass this whole process, right? If you know this subject matter, if you just know the answer, you don't have to do this. But what I'm helping y'all with, because we can't realistically, even though we'll do some of this in our prep sessions, we can't in-depth review every single literary period in a way that, you know, is, is going to give you the magic key to answering all of these. But if you have a technique for when you don't know the answer, my hope is that that can fill in the gaps for some of these tougher questions, right? Okay, so let's look at another question. Um, which of the following aspects of a 19th century novel would most likely be examined in a work of feminist literary criticism? So do y'all see any answer options here that look like they fall into the category of being a little bit too specific? And you can take a second and look at it. Like something that just doesn't, either doesn't make sense or is too specific. Can we eliminate any wrong answer options here? <laughs> Good, Emily, I totally agree with you. Remember also what this is asking for. This is asking you for an aspect of a novel that would be examined in a, the work of feminist literary criticism, right? And what does, even if you've never done quote unquote feminist literary criticism, right? You know what feminism is, yeah? Like feminism is the, you know, orientation toward the world that looks at establishing the equality of the sexes, right? Is advocating for, you know, like the elimination of oppressive structures that negatively affect women. So we know that, that's great. What does the nonlinear structure of plot have to do with feminism? I, I don't, I don't see it. And that's because it is, it, it's, it's, you know, first of all, uh, how would I say this? That's not a feature that would be considered by literary criticism, by feminist literary criticism, right? It's just not relevant to the question. So you're right, Emily, we can absolutely get rid of D, which is fantastic. Um, what about these other options, the descriptions of objects used for domestic chores? I agree with you, Emily, that C is way too specific. I totally and completely agree. And in fact, it is not the correct answer. We can get rid of it. It's a, an incorrect answer. Spencer, you agree, good. So that leaves us with A and B. Which one of these answer options looks more like something that a feminist scholar would be interested in? If I'm looking at the roles of men and women, Spencer, you're absolutely right. The dialogue spoken by male and female characters. Yes. It's the only answer option that has anything to do with like the tenets of feminism, right? And I could see actually with answer option C with the domestic chores response, this is also a distractor because it's related to the, to the subject matter at hand, right? Like you know, women are, you know, through, through much of history have been like kind of tasked with domestic labor and someone who's interested in that kind of criticism might look at, you know, might look at that kind of thing, but look at the stem of the question, which of the following aspects would most likely be examined in a work of feminist literary criticism? 
if you're writing like a PhD dissertation about, you know, 19th century analysis of 19th century household objects for domestic tours, that's one thing, but not for ELA, middle school and high school English, right? Feminist criticism, we're just looking at, as a professor of mine used to say, feminist literary criticism just means you look at a work of literature and the first question you ask is where are the women in this text and what are they doing, right? Okay, good. So you all kind of are kind of comfortable to going of to going through this process. If again, if you see a question and you immediately know the answer, all of this is out the window and you've saved yourself a ton of time. And in fact, I'm giving you a, a you know a, a new sort of window on this. You might notice we are spending an awful lot of time talking about these questions, right? And on the Intel, you won't have this much time to do this. But I want you to keep in mind, obviously, since we're doing this together, it's going to take longer, right? I'm working through this more slowly. But secondly, this is stuff you can do with the time that you have left over from answering questions that you already know the answer to because you've studied these sheets, because you have you know, paid attention in English class and have pulled this information together. So you'll have more time to do this um, with that, you know, with extra time to respond to these questions and go through this process. Okay, so I'm glad, Emily, this is helpful. That makes me so happy. Okay, so let's do a little bit of practice here. Whether or not you use the elimination of wrong answers technique is totally up to you. Again, in my next Intel session, I'm gonna look at communication and literacy and we're gonna do the same basic technique. And then in the session after that, we're gonna look more in depth at different literary time periods and how we can answer these questions correctly. But for now, let's just practice with this technique, right? If you know the answer, that's great. If you don't, see if you can use one of our strategies for getting rid of stuff. Okay, so here's a practice question that we can't really use the elimination of wrong answers quite as effectively, um, but let's just take a crack at this anyway. The works of which of the following groups of writers contributed significantly to the slave narrative genre of American literature? Okay. So I'm going to give you all a second to sit with that and uh, and see if you can gravitate toward a right answer based on your knowledge. Good. Emily said B right off the bat. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and how do you know that, Emily, if you wouldn't mind, if you want to type in the chat? How did you know? This one, again, does not lend itself very well to the methods, but I just thought it was a good example to show you how you can, you know, approach this. Good. Okay, so Emily says we're learning about it right now in the American Lit class. Yay, I love it. I love it. Okay, so I think Harriet Jacobs, if y'all can correct me, wrote um, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, I think. If I'm wrong, please tell me. Um, but anyway, uh, the other, some of those other options are trying to distract you and pull you away. So for example, like Ida B. Wells Barnett was a famous like investigative journalist in the early 1900s. And she was a black woman who looked at, you know, issues around racism. So it's trying to pull you away based on like, oh, I think I know that name, right? But you only need to know one name, even if you don't know William Wells Brown or Olauda, I think that's pronounced, Equ Equiano. I think that, by the way, interestingly enough, was the first slave narrative in North America, was that one? But anyway, um, you only need to know one, uh, one point of reference from a class that you're looking at, you know, to get that answer correct. Anyway, so that's sort of an outlier, but okay. So now let's look at this. So this is a read the question, answer based, read the passage, answer a question based on the passage kind of question. In our session about common literacy, I'm going to talk about how to approach reading a passage like this when you are short on time. But for now, let's forget about the constraints of time that we're gonna see on the test and let's just read through this excerpt um, and then come back together and look at the question. Some test prep teachers will say that you should read the question stem first. That would be this before you read the passage. And whether or not you do that is totally up to you. I would, while doing practice tests, see what works best for you. Some people swear by that method. Some people don't like it quite as much, right? But so see what works for you. We'll try it for this. How about that? Um, so the question stem is, in this excerpt, 
Garland explores which of the following aspects of rural life in the United States during the late 19th century. Okay, so I'm looking at aspects of rural life, 19th century. Okay, perfect. So this is from Under the Lion's Paw, a short story by Hamlin Garland, who I've never heard of. Um, I don't know about y'all. So this is 1891. All right, and I'm looking for something that is kind of most emblematic of rural life in the US in the late 19th century. Okay, great. So I'll give you all a second. Um, those of you who are, you know, uh, watching this asynchronously, if you want to pause and read this, um, but I'll also spend, you know, spend a moment on it. Um, and uh, Spencer and Emily, if y'all will read this, then we'll come back together and ask a question about it. I'll give you like three minutes. Okay, so I hope that was <laughs> enough time. So um, we just have here a very bleak picture of life on the farm, right? Um, like thankless, awful, you know, the cold and cheerless dawn and the, the, the coarse clothing and the, the pang of sympathetic pain and the darkness and muscle aching. Okay, so we have, this is a, uh, a bleak image here of what it might like be like in late, you know, 19th century America. Okay. So let's look at our answer options here. The sense of, so what are we looking at? The, which of the aspects of rural life in the US during the late 19th century we're exploring here? A, the sense of personal pride derived from making a living off of the land. Hmm. What do y'all think? Just right off the bat, that did not, doesn't feel right to me. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. There's nothing about pride here. Like this is bleak, it's sad, it's dark. This is not, this is, mm -mm, mm -mm, no. Okay, what about B? The difficulty of obtaining proper implements for cultivating the land. No, Emily, you're right. That is way too specific. It doesn't say anything in that passage about implements, about getting rakes or hoes or whatever you need to tend, till, till the land back in these olden timey days. Doesn't say anything about that. Um, no, so we can say no. So we've given ourselves a 50-50 shot here. I love the answer option D, by the way. Just a spoiler alert, we can get rid of it. The challenges posed to traditional gender roles by new labor laws. This says not a single thing about labor laws, and it doesn't say a single thing about any issue related to gender, right? Yeah, Emily says it legit says nothing about gender roles, not a single thing. I'm wondering if maybe what this is going for is a student who's not really reading the passage, who sees you know, Haskins works like a fiend and his wife, like the heroic woman that she was, bore uncomplainingly the most terrible burdens. Yeah, right, Emily says it does say one thing about labor laws, that's right, I've, I'll correct myself. It does mention child labor, but it doesn't say anything about the relationship between labor laws and gender roles, right? Um, and then there is the, the, the boy taking, place of a taking the place of a man in his work. But again, if you have to do this much you know, this, this, this many, in, you know, iterations of mental gymnastics, and you're not looking at a right answer, right? It's, it's too complicated. So going back to this, look at C, which is the only one we have left, the fatalistic attitude of farmers toward the hardships they endured. That is a spot on, perfect, perfectly suited for this question, correct answer. The answer to this question is C, the fatalistic attitude of farmers toward the hardships they endured. And check this out. You don't have to know anything about rural life in the US during the late 19th century to get that right, do you? You don't have to have any huge amount of background knowledge about 19th century rural, rural life. You don't have to have, you know, watched documentaries about what, was, what it was like to live on a farm back then. Everything you need, you can find in the passage, right? Which is fantastic. Is that always the case? No, but often it is, right? 
So let's go back and look at some of these answer options I promised we would return to. If you want to use this technique for uh, eliminating wrong answer options, you certainly can. Um, and I'll just kind of walk you through how you might do that as we look at these questions. So let's go back to this question about the Grapes of Wrath, this question 11. Um, so those of y'all who are watching this asynchronously, if you want to pause and read this passage, and um, Emily and Spencer, you can as well, but we will read the question stem first. This excerpt most clearly addresses which of the following themes of earliest early 20th century American literature. So we have another time period, you know, type of question. Okay, so I'm just going to pause recording. So those, those of y'all who are watching it asynchronously, you can pause and read the passage and Spencer and Emily, I'll give you a couple minutes. Yes. Okay, so let's look at our answer options here. And in fact, people who say that you should try to answer the question after just skimming the passage might have sort of a point here, but I, I just in general don't want to advocate for that technique. But let's take a look here. This excerpt most clearly addresses which of the following themes of early 20th, early 20th century American literature. A, the struggle by labor unions to gain legal protection for farm workers from exploitative employment practices. No, Emily says no. And I would say absolutely not also for a number of reasons. First of all, the passage does not say anything about legal issues, right? Emily says, doesn't say anything about legal protection. Um, and Spencer says it makes absolutely no sense. That's absolutely correct. Yep, doesn't make sense. It's not consistent. The only reason you might do that, you, and in fact, here's a great reason to read the passage and not just, you know, not just say, oh, I read the Grips of Wrath recently. I'm just going to take a crack at this because that answer option is counting on you not having read the passage at all, right? Or just skimmed it so that you like saw the word farm or something and just thought that it was the right thing, you know? So no. Um, what about B, the ways in which forced migration humbled many farming families who had once been proud and self-reliant? That's starting to, I, I'm, I don't know about y'all, but I'm drawn to answer option B, right? I mean, this is definitely talking about you know, the, so Emily says possibly, yep, that, you know, think of, look at this part of the passage, the families which had been units of which the boundaries were a house at night, a farm by day, changed their boundaries. In the long hot light, they were silent in the cars moving slowly westward, but at night they integrated with any group they found. There's this idea of the weary hot evenings, you know, that these, you know, that these, these people are just sort of silently and without anybody having to tell them what to do are moving west while setting up camp every night. And, you know, there's this, there's this quiet, this resolve, you know, also I just love, I don't know about y'all, I love Steinbeck. So it's a pleasure to read a passage of his um, compared to some people, no shade, as the kids might say. Do kids still say that? I don't know. Um, anyway, what about answer option C? So we're gonna leave B in, in, in the, on the bubble as a possibility. C, the influence of automobile ownership on the development of suburban communities and family life. What, the, no, absolutely 100% not. It mentions cars, but this passage is absolutely not talking about the about automobile ownership and the development of suburbs. Just, just, we don't need to talk about this anymore, just no. And what about D, the moral challenges confronted by young people moving from sparsely populated rural areas to big cities. So this, I think if you were taking this test and let's say this is one of the last questions that you were doing, you know, in the English language section and you weren't really paying attention, I could see you getting maybe confused between answer B and, and answer D because D has the kind of flavor of a right answer that there's the, you know, uh, the, the issue of moral challenges. It has, it has a right answer kind of taste to it. But Spencer, yeah, you're right. There's nothing about morals in the passage and nothing about big cities, right? Absolutely, Emily, you, both of y'all are absolutely correct, yep. So do we love option B? Uh, I mean, not really. I, I'm not crazy about it because I don't see anything about like pride and self-reliance, you know? I, it, I don't, I'm not crazy about it, but remember the question says, which most, most clearly addresses you know, it most clearly addresses which of the following themes. And 
these are not really themes of early early 20th century American literature anyway, but this B is the most correct answer, right? So the answer to that question is B. The answer to 11 is B. Okay. So yes, good, go team, good job. So would y'all, uh, Emily and Spencer, would you have probably selected B just based on it being kind of the most, having the most, um, what did Stephen Colbert call it, truthiness? Yeah, okay. Okay, good. So let's look then at number 31. Um, so this is a read the excerpt, answer the question and follows question. So we will read these three little paragraphs and then we're gonna consider the question, the style and subject matter of this excerpt are most characteristic of which of the following novelistic genres of the Victorian period? Whew. Okay, so I'm gonna pause the recording and give y'all about two or three minutes to read that. Okay, wonderful. So just first impressions of this passage. I don't know about y'all, but the impression I get from it is this is very, uh spooky it's dark it's a little ominous um this is i mean there's how have, how have we become involved in a web of horror uh this is a dark passage right um look in that first paragraph a step creak a momentary renewal of the snarling canine noise and a deep human groan um so we've got some dark stuff here right and if we look at our answer options I can see a couple, even if I'm not totally sure what genre this belongs to, even if I haven't taken a 19th century literature class, you know, even if I'm not totally 100% sure what's going on here, I feel like historical survey doesn't feel right to me, right? This is not a work of like historical, uh, this, is, this is not looking at historical issues in a new way, right? It just, that just doesn't feel feel right to me. In fact, if you look at the answer options, isn't there one that just stands out to you right away? Emily says, I feel like none of them really make sense besides C. Well, you're absolutely right because C is the answer. Um, that word, if you look at that passage and then that word Gothic doesn't just pop right out at you, um, then that might be a sign of uh, needing to just kind of go back and review the historical time periods again, right? Gothic has all of those hallmarks of dark foreboding, you know, this very like sensory description, kind of sometimes spooky, a little bit scary, looking at these kind of darker themes. And I think the one word that might throw you off if you have not studied this kind of literature before is that word romance. But bear in mind that in order for something to be a, you know, a gothic romance, it doesn't really necessarily have to be like, you know, the bodice and the petticoats and all that stuff. And like, you know, like kissing romance, romantic love romance. Do you like how awkwardly I'm explaining this? Um, but that the romantic period as a literary movement focused on like individual experiences, this sort of like embrace of being lonely and isolated, um, even like the sort of like ideation of uh, women and like the female form. So where we have this, what creature was it that masked in an ordinary woman's face and shape uttered the voice now of a mocking demon. There's a sort of like fascination with women, this idealization of the individual experience. And so those are not necessarily again, like, you know, kissy, romantic love, as we think of romance novels, right? Instead, this falls into the gothic romance, you know, genre, because you're alone, you're spooked, my thoughts are worrying me, what is this very sensual, very sensory, dark experience I'm having here? And again, C, Spencer says is a pick, you're right, y'all are right, 31, the answer is C. And I think also eliminating things like provincial realism. Um, even if you don't know what provincial realism is, does this feel like something that's realistic to us? Like the, the, the creature with the voice of a mocking demon? Mm -mm. Yeah, no, this is not a realistic, no, 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 not at all. Um, social problem, uh, unless there's like some social problem having to do with like the snarling of a mocking demon in people's lives, then no, this is a Gothic romance. This is a passage from a Gothic romance, right? Absolutely. Okay, so let's shift gears for the moment 
in our future Intel sessions, we're going to look more in depth at passages like this one, look more in depth in, in, into questions about literature. But for now, let's look at a couple of these rhetoric and composition questions that we scanned over before. So switching gears in our brains from literature to strategies that will help students learn to write, right? So this question asks, which of the following strategies would most effectively help a writer to identify problems with the rhythm and flow of a composition? So let's think about this. Okay, Emily says A right away. Emily, why A? You didn't take long to come up with that one. And take your time typing. Because rhythm and flow Right, Emily says, when you say it out loud, it comes out naturally the way the writer wants you to hear it. Exactly right. Rhythm and flow are questions of how a text reads, right? How a text sounds. Rhythm and flow when it comes to, I mean, think about when it comes to music, when you hear that term when it comes to music, those have to do with how texts actually sound. So that reading the composition aloud from beginning to end is going to be the one that helps you to focus on those elements, right? Something like each examining each sentence for meaning has nothing to do with flow. Reviewing the parts of speech of each sentence in a composition, no, for, I mean, no, first of all, I mean, sentences don't have parts of speech, so that's bizarre anyway. Um, but then replacing long words with shorter words, I, I could see that kind of distracting somebody. Spencer says all the other choices slow you down, which is absolutely right. Um, you know, shorter words don't necessarily help with, with, with flow. Emily says, think about when you read the lyrics on paper, it's monotone just in your head. Right, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Reading something out loud gives you a sense of its rhythm. Absolutely, yes. Okay, so that's correct. The answer to 78 is A. Okay, and what about this outline question? I promised we would go over. So a student is developing a four paragraph essay about his hobby of spinning wool into yarn. Again, very, very wholesome, very quaint. A draft of the student's outline for the essay appears below. Um, so we have introduction, spinning is an ideal hobby. I guess that's the thesis. Section two, personal benefits of spinning wool. A, forming friendships with other spinners. B, gives you a creative outlet, such as experimenting with dyes and designing patterns for knitting. Three, practical benefits of spinning wool, saving money and blank. Conclusion, everyone should try it. Okay. So we know that the point, the supporting point we wanna include there in B supports the idea of practical benefits, right? A practical benefit of spinning wool, one is that you save money. So let's look at the options, gaining a sense of accomplishment from learning a new skill, using organic materials to dye wool, reducing stress by spinning wool, or helping the environment by using natural rather than synthetic fiber. What do y'all think? What answer option stands out to you here? It seems like D, I'd probably go D. Yes, absolutely. Those are those practical types of benefits. And if we wanted to, you know, reducing stress, gaining a sense of accomplishment, those would go under the heading of personal benefits of spinning wool, right? Um, so D, there is one that, you know, like helping, helping the environment is something that is a practical benefit. Using organic materials to dye wool might be like something you could do to benefit the environment in the course of this project, but it, that wouldn't go under the heading of, uh, of, of being a practical type of benefit, right? Um, okay, excellent job. So let's look at just a couple of more of these. These are our grammar and mechanics type questions. So I want to just do a quick review because I guarantee you this will come up on the MTEL for you, I promise. No matter what they do with the test, this will come up on common literacy. This is something that you have to know in order to do well on the section of the MTEL, right? I'm gonna get my handy dandy whiteboard that Emily from my grammar class knows all too well. Okay. So when it comes to sentences, the Intel loves to ask you about a couple of pieces of punctuation that you might not be super familiar with. They love asking about the colon. They love asking about the semicolon. 
they sometimes will ask about the about a dash right and they love asking you about what about whether or not you can identify a complete sentence right so i want to just explain to you what each of these pieces of punctuation does it will help you on the mtel right okay so the humble colon here the colon is these two little dots what colons do in a sentence is they introduce a list right almost always so i'll show you what i mean they either introduce a list or they introduce an item at the like at the end of a sentence but they are set off from the sentence in a way that um you can have and well maybe i should back up and explain this a little bit more a sentence has to have at least one what we'd call an independent clause you might feel scared if you're not in my grammar class because this might be something you haven't looked at in a while but sentences have to have at least one independent clause right without it you don't have a sentence you don't have a complete sentence an independent clause is a group of words that has a subject and a verb and expresses a complete thought. Right? Okay. Independent clause. It has a subject, it has a verb, it expresses a complete thought. A dependent clause has a subject and a verb, but it does not express a complete clause. It's dependent because it cannot stand alone in the sentence. It cannot exist without an independent clause somewhere near it. Dependent clauses cannot be independent standalone sentences. They're dependent because they depend on something else in order for them to make sense, right? An independent clause, you have all the information you need, right? So here's an example of an independent clause. I love dogs. We have a subject, we have a verb, we have an object. If you don't know the, the subject verb object thing, it's okay. You know subjects and verbs, right? Verbs are action words. Subjects are, the, it's a noun, a person, place, or a thing that is doing the action in the sentence, right? So this is a complete thought. This is an independent clause. It does not need a man. It doesn't need anybody to depend on. It can exist in the world totally on its own, right? It's a sentence. It's an independent clause. But what if I said something like this? I don't know if y'all remember Cujo. It's like, so I think a horror movie dog, an awful, awful dog, right? If I said words like accept Cujo, right? This is not a complete sentence. It cannot stand alone, right? In fact, this one doesn't even have a subject and a verb. There's no verb here. There's no action word here, right? So this is not a complete sentence. This is a fragment or a piece of a sentence. It doesn't make any sense, right? But here's what a dependent clause might look like where I have a subject and a verb, but I'm not expressing a complete thought, right? I used an example like this in our grammar class this past week. Um, okay. Sorry. I just want this to be perfect. So let's say you get called into your boss's office for a performance review. And your boss said something like this. Though we appreciate your hard work, we have a subject and a verb here, right? We is your subject. Appreciate is a verb. We have a subject and a verb, but this does not express a complete thought because if your boss said this to you, it would scare the crap out of you because you'd want to know what else was coming, right? <laughs> Though we appreciate your hard work, comma, what are you about to say? We have to let you go and what's coming here, right? It depends on more information for it to make sense. So this is a dependent clause, right? 
Okay, so those are independent and dependent clauses. And if you're still confused about that, just do a quick search for on Google for a few examples of independent and dependent clauses. But what you need to know is it is not a complete sentence unless it has at least one independent clause, but you can hook several dependent clauses up to one independent clause. What the Intel wants to know is if you know how to punctuate independent clauses correctly, right? Now the colon, like I said, introduces a list or it can sometimes be used like this, like, um, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. I had the best donuts from my favorite bakery, Miss Murphy's. I miss that place. Okay, I had the best donuts from my favorite bakery. Maybe I should have written this differently because I have a colon over here. So this, as you can see, is a depend or an independent clause, right? I had the best donuts from my favorite bakery. Sorry, I should have included this. That could stand alone as a sentence, right? It expresses a complete thought. But I have a colon here because I wanna tell you what that bakery is. And I introduce it here. I introduce an item or a list. It is Miss Murphy's. So colons separate independent clauses from dependent clauses, right? We don't see a whole lot of colon related questions on the MTEL. Usually what they're going to ask you about is the dreaded semicolon. They assume that you don't know how to use it or that it confuses you. So they love asking about it, right? So here is the trick with a semicolon. On either side of a semicolon, you have to have two independent clauses, right? So you cannot have, for example, something like this. My favorite season was about to start. Semicolon spring. You cannot separate these two items, right? This independent clause from this word because what is on either side of a semicolon has to be an independent clause. Now, what you can also see with it is, an is a semicolon and a conjunction, right? Something like this. I love traveling, semicolon. However, we are in a pandemic. Sorry for the squeaking. So you see here that I have a semicolon, right? But I have two independent clauses, right? I have a semicolon and what we call a coordinating conjunction or a transition here into another independent clause. But an, a semicolon can also separate without that. So it could just say, This is a bad sentence, but you get it. I love traveling, semicolon. I wish we could travel. Yes, Emily, it combines two complete sentences. You are absolutely correct. And why might I choose to do this? Let me ask you that question. Why would I not just put a period and start a new sentence, right? What would be my rationale for doing that? For rhetoric. Yes, Emily, you are absolutely correct. Yes, Spencer. I want to show that those two thoughts are connected to each other, right? Absolutely. Um, let's see. And in fact, I don't know if y'all have seen this trend of, I mean, I don't know if it's still a trend now because I'm totally disconnected from the world, but um, how people will get tattoos of semicolons. 
And the symbolic meaning behind that is like the sentence of your life is not over, right? Like it's going to keep going. There's more coming. There's another sentence. There's another passage. There's more coming. Like it does not punctuate a final thought. So that might help you to remember semicolons connect thoughts. So they can, they connect two complete sentences. So if you see a semicolon, you know, there has to be a independent clause on either side of it. Right. And that's what the MTEL is checking. If you are aware of, I tried hard in her class semicolon. I studied for hours each day. So I'm using this semicolon because I want to show, as y'all said, I want to show there's a relationship between these two independent clauses, these two sentences, right? Now, what the MTEL will often do is it will show you an incorrectly used semicolon, right? So something like, I tried hard in her class, semicolon, more than others. No. And a way to check that is just to, in your mind, erase this part and tell me if this can stand alone more than others. No, it can't. And you don't have to be like a master grammarian to know when you see a sentence that is not done, right? You don't have to have somebody explain that to you. It clangs on your ear. It doesn't make sense. So those are semicolons. So let's look at this question 83. Which of the following sentences contains an error in punctuation? Do you see our friend the semicolon here and here and here and here? So let's look at what's on each side of the semicolon here, right? The film, and we're looking for the error, not the correct usage, right? The film is about overcoming pain, semicolon. In a way, it is a film about hope. We're good there, right? If you imagine a period instead of a semicolon and you know punctuate that second clause correctly, this film is about overcoming pain, period. In a way, it's a film about hope. Those are two independent clauses, right? So that's good. Excellent. That's used correctly. That is a correctly used semicolon. What about this next one? Sally took the north route. Another climber took the south route. Great, right? Those are two complete sentences. Both sides of the semicolon look great to me. Fabulous. What about C? Uh-oh. The valley tends to be hot in the summer, semicolon, snowy in the winter. Emergency, emergency, code red. Snowy in the winter is not a standalone sentence, right? That's not an independent clause. It cannot stand alone. That is not right. So C is the correct answer to 83, right? It, that is not how semicolons work. We can look at D, but D is correctly punctuated, right? So we know that it's perfectly fine to say semicolon. However, comma, he questioned many of the details. We have two independent clauses on the other side of that colon, semicolon, but snowy in the winter is not a complete sentence. And as we practice this, we'll see this was common lit too. They love asking about the semicolon because they bank on you not knowing how to use it. The trick is imagine again that there's a period instead of a semicolon and tell me if this is a complete sentence to you. And you know it's not right? It'll stand out to you. It'll clang on your ear. You know this is not a complete sentence. There's no verb, right? Um, okay, so does that make a little bit more sense as far as semicolons go? We'll look at plenty of these in future MTEL prep sessions. And if you don't know how semicolons work now, you will uh, after a couple of these sessions, I promise. Um, okay, now let's look at 85. Which of the following sentences contains a comma splice? What you might ask is a comma splice? A comma splice is when you incorrectly punctuate two, in, or two or more independent clauses. You cannot use a comma to separate two independent clauses. You just can't, right? So if I have something like this, I love dogs. I love her dog most. Let's say I'm looking at this and I say, actually, I want to bring these two sentences together. I want to join them together somehow. What are my options for doing that? What would be my options for joining these two sentences into one sentence? We just talked about one of them. Exactly. Yes, Emily. I could use a semicolon. Yep. I love dog semicolon. I love her dog most. Exactly. Yep. I could do that. 
I could also use a comma, right? A comma and what we call a coordinating conjunction. You don't need to know the word for that. Good, Emily, yes. So I could say, I love dogs, comma, and I love her dog most. Yep, those would be my options for joining these two sentences, right? What I could not do grammatically, I could not just put a comma there. I love dogs, comma, I love her dog most. You cannot use a comma to separate two independent clauses. So if you get a question on the MTEL and it is asking you if there's a comma splice, you need to look on what is on either side of the comma and see if both items are independent clauses or sentences that could stand alone, right? So if you see comma splice question, look for the comma and say, do I have complete sentences on either side of that? So let's look at these answer options. Um, which of these following sentences contains a comma splice? A, spectators should bring their umbrellas and galoshes, comma, for it is going to rain, okay? B, the lake is a good place to cool off, although the snapping turtles are a little scary. Some people prefer to add cheese to their grits while other people prefer to add butter, yum. Or D, it is important to till the soil. This simple part of the process yields big results. Uh, you're absolutely right, Spencer, that D is, is correct. D contains a comma splice because there are, yes, Emily, D, because there are two sentences that could stand alone on either side of the comma. So the way that I tell students to do this with a comma splice is replace, in your mind, replace the comma with a period. And if you have two independent sentences on either side of it, then that is a comma splice. You cannot use a comma to separate them. So look at this one. Spectators should bring their umbrellas and galoshes, period. For it is going to rain, period. For it is going to rain, cannot stand alone. We're all good. Although the snapping turtles are a little scary. That's not an independent clause, I'm all set. While other people prefer to add butter, not a complete sentence, that's okay. This simple part of the process yields big results. That is a complete sentence. We cannot use a comma to separate two independent clauses or independent sentences, right? Fun fact, if you do that, you have created a run-on, that just fell in, fell in my coffee. You've created a, a run-on sentence, right? So a run-on sentence is when you have incorrectly joined independent clauses together, right? So a comma splice creates what we call a run-on sentence. It is improperly punctuated independent clauses, right? Or sentences, rather. Okay. So we are actually for this session out of time. So what I would tell y'all to do in preparation for our next session is to take a look at those literary timeline, literary period uh, PDF files that are in that folder I shared with you and see if you can find one um, that kind of meets your learning styles, right? And also I'm gonna give you another piece of homework, which is to pick one of the literary genres or literary time periods that you are not studying right now that you're curious about and want to know more about and see if you can just give yourself a little crash course in it. Watch a YouTube video about it. That's kind of the magic of the internet. Um, read somebody, you know, a blog post or a, a description of, of it from somebody who has read about it or find, you know, I don't know, a film that's based on a book that is in that genre and take a look at it, but just familiarize yourself with one time period or genre that you were not familiar with before. I'm not gonna test you on this or anything. I just wanna prompt you to do a little bit of familiarizing work with yourself with something that you might not have been acquainted with before. Because if you start making a habit of doing that like once a week or once every couple of weeks, by the time you take the MTEL, you'll be in really good shape as far as being familiar with stuff. And if you study it and then you talk about it in class, that's great then you're just supporting that knowledge even further. And by the way, that doesn't just help you on the MTEL, it helps you when you're in the classroom because then you can answer students' questions, you can better introduce them to these movements and time periods, you can share your love and appreciation of literature with a group of students and that's why we want to be English teachers in the first place, right?
Um, okay, so uh, that concludes our first Intel Saturday session. Uh, we will be back date TBA, so keep your eyes peeled for that to talk about the communication and literacy test. Um, and then we will come back together in our next Saturday session and talk about literary genres and time periods in a little bit more depth. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. And thank you uh, very much for watching.